Hola amigos de Astrofísicos en Acción, aquí Norberto una vez más. El día de hoy les tenemos preparado un video que grabamos desde el año pasado, pero lo guardamos para esta semana porque el 15 de julio es el cumpleaños de Jocelyn Bell Burnell. ¿Quién es Jocelyn Bell? Bueno, pues es una astrofísica británica a quien se le acredita el descubrimiento del primer pulsar, nada más. Este descubrimiento se llevó a cabo en el Observatorio de Radioastronomía de Cambridge mientras ella era estudiante de doctorado. Más tarde, el trabajo sobre este pulsar le valió a Anthony Hewish y Martin Wright el Premio Nobel de Física. Era la primera vez que se otorgaba un Premio Nobel de Física a un astrónomo. Sin embargo, Jocelyn Bell no recibió este premio, lo que dio origen a una controversia que persiste hasta nuestros días. No obstante, Jocelyn Bell ha recibido una gran cantidad de reconocimientos debido a su larga carrera como astrofísica. El año pasado, el Instituto Politécnico Nacional organizó una serie de conferencias y mesas de discusión en las que Jocelyn Bell fue la invitada estelar. Y nosotros, los astrofísicos en acción, tuvimos la oportunidad de asistir a una de ellas. ¡Corre video! Hola amigos de Astrofísicos en Acción y amantes de Jocelyn Bell. Ah, estamos aquí, afuera, sentados. Y ven ahí, ahí, todo eso. Es una fila, sí. sí. Tenemos el cuarto lugar en la fila. Sí. Y esto es porque venimos a un evento que está haciendo en el Poli, porque el Poli trajo a Jocelyn Bell. Eh, varios días. A ver. Hoy va a ser un diálogo con estudiantes, ya tenemos varias preguntas para ella. Vamos a preguntarle cómo se mantiene motivada en la academia, cómo es, qué es lo más difícil que se ha encontrado en su carrera y otras cositas más. Voy a ver si me autografía mi tatuaje, porque estos son pulsares. Y aquí estamos con la maestra Sara, que es una invitada especial. ¿Qué le vas a preguntar a Jocelyn Bell, Sara? <risa> ¿En inglés o en español? En inglés, en English, please. ¿Qué piensa del falta de chambation. Sí, ¿cómo se dice en inglés? The, the lack of chambation. of chambation in astronomy. ¿Por qué no hay jobs para nosotros en la astrophysics? ¿Ustedes qué le preguntarían a Jocelyn Bell? Déjenlo en los comentarios. Y bueno, ahorita vamos a cortar y a ver cómo nos va. ¿Vale? Amigos, toda la conferencia fue en inglés, así que tuve que subtitularla. Por ello, les recomiendo que activen los subtítulos aquí en la parte inferior derecha de su pantalla en YouTube. Sí. Nobel Prize, as I have tried to explain, was very important for astrophysics because it meant that other astrophysicists could in future receive a Nobel Prize. And that undoubtedly has been true. Um, I find curious the interest in Nobel Prizes and to maybe diffuse that interest a bit. There are now several other big prizes, including the Breakthrough Prize, with more money than the Nobel Prize. That's the key. So there is the Shaw Prize in Mathematics, there is the Gruber Prize in Cosmology, there is the Kavli Prize in Cosmology. I may have forgotten one or two, but there are a number now. Um, usually endowed by a rich man, nearly all men, um, who have an interest in cosmology or mathematics or something like that. Yeah. Uh, the Nobel Prize is held in great awe, maybe slightly less now than there are some other prizes, but it's been held with very great respect, too great respect, and it comes with a big sum of money. So if you get a Nobel Prize, You do not get anything else because anything else is minor compared with the Nobel Prize. So people say, she's had a Nobel Prize, we won't give her the diddly diddly tom bom prize, whatever it is. Whereas I have found if you do not get a Nobel Prize, people give you every other prize there is. <laughs> <laughs> and that has been much more fun. <laughs> a Nobel Prize is a fantastic week in Stockholm in Sweden. And afterwards you think it was a dream, it was so fantastic. But if you get lots of other prizes each year, there is a party. <laughs> Or you get to come to Mexico. <laughs> Or things like that, which is much more fun. Hi Patricia, uh, I'm a PhD student. What is the biggest um, obstacle that you faced in your career? The biggest obstacle for me 
um, and I'm a lot older than you, I'm now 75, so this is going back a bit, but the biggest obstacle for me was being a wife and mother. Um, I've already said that women, married women were not expected to work. Um, it was proven, apparently, that if mothers worked, the children would be delinquent. <laughs> How many of your mothers have worked? And how many of you are delinquent? <laughs> yeah, there's always one in the back row. <laughs> I, it was absolute rubbish, but you could hear professors, male professors, telling you that mothers should not work. And so there were no nurseries, creches for children. And uh, in addition, my husband had to move to different parts of the country regularly to get promotion. So I have not had a research career. Um, I have worked in gamma ray astronomy, x-ray astronomy, infrared astronomy, millimeter wave astronomy, as well as radio astronomy, because each of those was the place nearest where I was living, sorry, the place, the astronomy place nearest where I was then living did gamma or X or infrared or whatever. And uh, I wanted to work part time because of the problems of looking after the child. Uh, and so when we moved to a new area for my husband's job, I would write a begging letter and got the kind of job you get when you write a begging letter. Uh, I would work my way up that organization. Then husband would say, we must move. Do you have a board game in Mexico? We call it snakes and ladders. Yeah. OK, so I would climb up a ladder and sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually had advantages because I often did not get a research post. I got a support post, or I was in charge of a group of people, managing a group of people, or I was leading a department, or... So I have had the chance to try many different kinds of job in science. Uh, and that's been very, very useful, I think, for me once I emerged from that phase. But I hope today it is a lot easier for women I hope that maybe they can work part-time if they need to, and that is not seen as inferior. Maybe there are child-minding opportunities. But there is still always the two-body problem. You and your husband need jobs fairly close together, please. <laughs> and that's very hard to solve, and certainly I think we've not yet solved that one properly. <laughs> I, I have one child, and he is now a physics professor, so yes, he is delinquent. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah. Yeah, I am also a PhD student. And, uh, well, we know that the number of um, as, uh, students in astronomy are increasing with the time. But also, uh, there is a lack of uh, research positions everywhere. And I understand that maybe the postdoc's position is like, a in, uh, like an immediate solution, but it's becoming also a, a problem now. So uh, do you think that there is an immediate uh, solution to that? I'm not sure there is an immediate solution to that. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the funding situation is in Mexico, but I know that in Britain, we are training many more PhD students than there will be posts. And we tell them when they start, only one in four of you will stay in astronomy. And they think it's me, it's not them, not them. They will go, I will stay. Everybody believes that. <laughs> It's very difficult. Um, as you go through your PhD, your postdoc, note what extra skills you are getting. 
you are not just getting training as an astronomer or a physicist. Maybe you are getting experience of working in a group. Maybe you are providing some leadership. Maybe you run something. You coordinate the postgraduate group or something like that. Note these additional skills because these will be good when you look for a job outside astronomy, which you may have to do. Personally, it was the birth of my child, where women have given birth to children. I think that's a very special experience. So that was the probably the most important personal one. I think professionally it has to be around the discovery of pulsars because that was such a surprise and so exciting a time. It was not a single incident, it went on for several months, but it, it was a very exciting time. Yeah. Thank you for those questions. That's an interesting one. Um, I think I've always had the sense, the ethos of doing as well as I can each day. And maybe it's because I'm religious, but I, I suspect, I think it's part of the culture that I was brought up in. You are given a life probably just one life, as far as I know. Uh, uh, and I think it's important for you to make the best use you can of that life. Um, I mentioned that I belong to a church. It's a church called the Quakers. Um, not very well known in Mexico, but there is a small Quaker meeting in Mexico. And part of the ethos of that is to be of service, to help people help the world get better every day. Astrophysics group, the Astrophysics Outreach Group. It's Astrophysicus in Action. Astrophysical in Action. In Action. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. Thank you. <laughs> Ahí está Jocelyn Bell firmando autógrafos. Ahí está. Y yo en mi brazo tengo tatuados los pulsares que se conocían hasta este momento porque estos estaban en una placa de oro a bordo de las naves Pioneer y después en las Voyager. Y gracias a ello podemos nosotros, gracias a estos, nosotros podemos eh, medir distancias en la galaxia y porque el sol se encuentra aquí en el centro. Las rayitas representan la frecuencia de pulso de los pulsares y Jocelyn Bell me lo autografió con sus iniciales. Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Hasta aquí el video de hoy amigos, espero que les haya gustado. Les mando un gran saludo a todos los que nos ven y les recuerdo que pueden seguirnos en nuestras redes sociales que estarán apareciendo en pantalla. Nos vemos en el siguiente video. Adiós. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.